Hey, it's really, really good to be back with Lakeside. And, um, you know, some of you that were here, gosh, it was almost seven years ago. Can you imagine that? And uh, Ray and Dora, I don't even see them here today. They spent several days with us in Panama and really helped us out. And I have to tell you that I appreciate and uh, just covet uh, your prayers and your financial support as we were in Panama. You always hear that about missionaries, right? Like, you know, we need your prayers. And then when you actually do it, you go, oh my goodness, I need the church to be praying for me. Uh, because every day was battle. And of course, this is Memorial Day weekend, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm reflecting on the, the screen where you saw the, uh, the, the cemetery. And I've been overseas to see a couple of those cemeteries, and it's just overwhelming. Uh, the sacrifice that people have done on our behalf to have freedom. And uh, so today, we're, we live free. We get to drive here. We, live, we uh, spent the weekend in Green Lake. I had no problems coming up here, the two-hour drive. There's like no traffic issues. Do you think you have traffic issues? <laughs> I mean, like, I'm a newer spreader blocking your way. That's not really a traffic problem. <laughs> anyway, my lovely wife of 32 years, um, we walked away from our service here, and I'm not just saying that because I'm here. If there was ever a time that I thought, okay, if I'm not going to plant a church, your sweetness, the, the spirit that Lakeside people extended to us was just overwhelming. Uh, because when you know you're called to be a pastor, and then you remove yourself from that because you're sensing God calling you to do something else, of course, in our case, it was Panama, um, it's like, what, could I ever come back to an existing church? So here's what I want to tell you. It's a blessing to have a local fellowship. And I don't think I always realized that. And I, I don't think I always realized that it was such a blessing to be a pastor of people. So I know you love Pastor Jeremy, and uh, I know you're praying for him. I get to follow him. I met him last October at the annual meeting in Oshkosh. And just, you know, I think there was a, a connection, a media connection. So I get to follow him on Facebook, and I get to pray for your church when it pops up and so forth. So it's an honor for me to be here. So thanks. Why don't we dive into God's Word? Why don't we uh, join our hearts together and uh, just prepare ourselves for the Word, okay? Let's pray. Father God, thank you for uh, your goodness. Thank you for your provision and your grace and your mercy. Thank you that you draw people unto yourself and you get to use us somehow that you choose to use us to reach lost people for Christ. So I thank you for Lakeside Community Church. I thank you that it's a, a beachhead for this county and this area. And I pray that you would draw more people, that even today as we hear about the great things happening in small groups this summer, Lord, that people would not just take the summer off, that they would kickstart and have even a thriving personal devotion to you during the summer months. Thank you again for the honor to be here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be in uh, Galatians 5 today, so if you have your smartphone or your Bible, um, if I sound a little different, it was ironic, I haven't been sick in a couple of years, and I came down and I don't, I don't feel sick, I just sound sick, and uh, I'm in coffee and my wife the other night said, yeah, you kind of grossed me out last night because you're coughing on my face all night, <laughs> and I'm like, honey, for sickness, <laughs> it's sickness and in health, <laughs> so uh, she didn't think that was funny. I want to kind of rewind and just do a quick flyover the time that we have this morning because I really think it's critical that we are reminded of who we are in Christ. And Paul is writing this letter uh, to the church in Galatia, and it's, he's really refuting what's going on. So ironically, um, Judaizers were coming in saying, okay, if you want to be a Christian, that's great, but you still have to adhere to the traditions of Judaism. And, uh, you know, Paul's writing this letter to say, no, you're missing the point here. And quite frankly, uh, there's a new way, uh, and we don't have to be circumcised. Men say amen. amen. Don't have to be circumcised. Uh, but if a Gentile during that time wanted to become a Jew, they had to go through this process, and uh, they had to be um, basically circumcised. And that was their commitment to that. When Jesus came, obviously Jesus was Jewish, right? 
and he superseded Judaism. And again, it took them, think first century, it took them a while for them to really understand that. We take so much for granted. Can I hear an amen? We just like assume things and we look, we look at the Bible sometimes and we read it and we go, well, I know that story. So you skim it with, diff- with these, these eyes that you think you know. That's why it's so important to study God's Word and kind of parse it out and dissect it and, and you read it every day because you're changing, right? You're growing closer to Christ. Yes, amen? And so you read it today and you go, I never caught that last year when I read the same passage. It's living and powerful. It's active. And so it knows your thoughts and intentions. I love the fact that the circumcision that Jesus now does on us is in the heart. I don't know you, about you, but I, I'm, I have surgery like every day. Like he is working on me every day. I don't know about you, but I haven't arrived. Have you ever arrived? Turn to your neighbor and say, I have not arrived. Come on now. All right. We live in today that we should be reminded that we know and we always will be an absolute beauty in God's eyes. Think about that for a minute. The Bible says that you're the apple of his eye. Your identity, our identity in Christ. I'm moving back. I've been gone from this beautiful state in seven, you know, for seven years, and I'm hearing these things. We now live in Hudson, Wisconsin, and I'm just hearing about the rampant drug use. You know, opium. Are you kidding me? I didn't even know. There's a, there's a Minnesota, Wisconsin task force targeting, trying to help people get out of opium. Your county, no doubt. It's either meth, heroin, certainly marijuana. Why do I bring that up? Because those people that are doing those things, they're living as the flesh. And there's a void deep, deep in their soul. And they stumbled into it, and now they're addicted, and now they're dying. I mean, the amount of deaths doesn't maybe apply to you today, but your neighbors with these people, you go to school with these people, you're going to be graduating, and probably in a few years you're going to hear horrific sad stories of people losing their life because of addiction. Paul wants to focus in this section in chapter 5, well actually the whole book, there's two forces. Do you ever feel like you're conflicting with yourself? Come on, let's, let's just raise the hand today. There's, there's two hands up. Really? All right. It's the Holy Spirit and your sinful nature. You know, these evil desires are your inclinations. The Holy Spirit is stronger, but the danger is if we rely on our own strength and and wisdom, we're still going to make wrong decisions. That's why you need a body of believers. You need that small group. You need the church covering. You need a pastor. You need godly people around you to say, hey, am I, am I off base? You need to be connected to the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's going to convict you. I've made a lot of, we've made a lot of transitions in the last few years. And I have to tell you one thing that's been constant, it's the confirmation of the Holy Spirit and godly, godly counsel around me. And if I, had, if I didn't have godly counsel, I probably wouldn't make some of the decisions I made. And if the godly counsel said, oh, no, Glenn, you should not go into this new step of faith or this new work, I would listen to that. And if my wife said, hey, we're not doing that, guess what? (laughs) Okay. Galatians 5.16. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. And then Paul defines what the flesh is. And if you don't know this, or you just need a reminder this morning, that's okay. But in 17, verses 17 to 19, it says, for the desires of the flesh are what? Against. That's that struggle that we struggle with. It's this battle that we, we wage. And the desires of the Spirit, the desires of the Spirit, which we want the Spirit, amen, are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Remember Romans 7, what Paul says? Let's take a note and look that up later. Because you're not going outside today. you got nothing to do. There's no good football on TV. (laughs) Verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, that's a desire, right? You are not under the law. 
Now the works of the flesh are evident. And then Paul lists these 15 byproducts of self-living. You can look at them at yourself. Obviously in the, in the New Testament, you see example after example of what it looks like to live in the flesh. All you have to do in America today is turn on the news and you see what living in the flesh produces. Every day. In fact, I don't think I've remembered putting on the 5.30, 5 o'clock news and seeing where you had examples of people living in the Spirit. That's how dark we live in this world, in this culture. So then Paul switches to speak of the fruit of the Spirit, and you ask, you know, what is that? Well, let's look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is, let's read it together. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such things there's no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. So we're going to just unpack that this morning. Do I have 15 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, two hours? You look at the single word of fruit, it really reminds us of agricultural farming. It's this idea of planting season. You know, we're driving up here and crops are coming up, right? And so there's a season that we live in and we know that, you know, corn knee high by the 4th of July, right? Did you you know that? I grew up with that. And then oaks, you know, oak tree, they're beautiful, magnificent. It takes a long time to grow an oak. You ever seen a redwood out in California? You're like, they're mammoth. Thousands of years, it seems like. But it's this idea of fruit. And there are some things that are suggested by the Holy Spirit when we, when we look at this. I love what Pastor Tim Keller, have you heard of Tim Keller? Um, he's given us like these four overviews to remind us of the fruit of the Spirit. And so Christian growth is gradual. It takes time. Um, you can't rush it. We live in this culture that we want to just microwave our spirituality, don't we? And then, you know, we're we're pretty judging too, aren't we? Because we kind of self-impose. Why aren't they fast farther down the road? Why don't they get it? You ever grow up in that church where you're pretty critical of the unsaved people? Why are they doing that? They don't know any better. They don't have the fruit of the Spirit. They're living by the flesh. Second point is the growth of the Spirit's fruit is inevitable. There is growth that will occur. That's good news, isn't it? Can I hear an amen? I could show you, uh, I don't have my smartphone on me, I could show you our youngest grandbaby, Paxton. She's one. She just started walking, what, in the last three weeks? Um, The good news is she is going to grow up, and she's going to have a high school graduation in about 18 years. And her parents are very happy about that. We were very happy to... See our kids grow up and transition out. You know, and as a side note, we always told our kids, we want you to want to come back to visit us and hang out and have a good time and talk about spiritual things. I was telling Pastor Jeremy that my son coaches lacrosse, my son-in-law coaches basketball, they love coaching. I used to coach track and football, so we have that commonality. We were talking about the issues with coaching today with parents. I mean students. <laughs> but our spiritual growth is inevitable. And so you're going to have these seasons. So now you have high school students. Any college students graduating in here? Yeah? They don't want to raise their hand, but it's okay. It's these transitions of life. And uh, they're a good thing. And when Paul is writing this, he's saying, listen, the fruit of the Spirit, it's going to happen if you're living in the Spirit. And the third point is the fruit of the Spirit has internal roots. You know, it's not about these characteristics or these traits. It's about a deep change. It's much different Um, because we are different. The Bible says that we're a peculiar people, right? Do you feel different? You're looking at me like, what are you talking about? (laughs) All through high school, I never felt like I fit in. Can Can I just hear an amen? I didn't fit in. It took me a while to realize this is a dark place. And I'm the only Christian in my class. I'm not supposed to fit in. That's a good thing. 
The world is not going to embrace us. Paul says, hey, live by the Spirit because you're not going to receive the criticism that the typical world is going to give us when they see Christ shining through us. They're not going to like us. They're like, man, they, they live holy lives. They're walking in step with Christ. How can you criticize Jesus? Hello? Think of this apple tree. Do apple trees, when we're driving up whatever road that was, 54, 47, I can't remember. And I saw the orchard apples. Do the apples make that tree alive? No, because you could take a dead apple tree and go down to the grocery store and put some apples on it. The tree is still dead. Apples don't give life, but it's a sign that there's life. We could put a bunch of bananas on you. It doesn't mean you're a banana tree. It doesn't mean that you produce that. But you're going to have this residual of what is your life like? What are people going to remember you by? What do people know you that you're about? And we tend to see these gifts, honestly, as the Spirit's work in someone's life, which is true, but the Bible doesn't necessarily think that or show that Judas and King Saul were used by the Spirit to prophesy, to do miracles and so forth. They did not have the Spirit renewed hearts in them. And so we see that in Scripture. To be truly led by the Spirit is to grow the fruit of the Spirit, and fruit growth can only happen to the child of God. So a non-believer does not have the Spirit of the living God. So they're not going to have these characteristics. They're not. They can have morality. They can do some things that are, that are okay, that are good. But at the end of the day, it's because they're created in the image of God. And even the most heinous, by the way, I was in law enforcement for many years. I met a lot of bad people. But they can still have an element of goodness in them doesn't mean that they're born again. doesn't mean they're Christ followers. So don't mistake that. You've got to have the Holy Spirit indwelling in you. It's the byproduct of repentance, you know, where you meet, know, and follow Jesus. The fourth point is Christian growth is symmetrical. Paul intentionally uses a singular word, fruit. It's not fruits. It's fruit to describe the whole list that grow in the Spirit-filled person. And the real fruit of the Spirit always grows up together. Isn't that good news? But I think there's this being intentional of, are we putting on Christ every day? I mean, if we're in the Word every day and we're saying, Lord, um, what do you want me to get out of this today? And I always tell people when I disciple them, it's like, don't read for distance. Don't get me wrong. I love Bible reading programs. There's these starting points. But I typically read one chapter a day, and then I'm focusing on things. I highlight, I underline, and then I come back the next year or months later, and I go, I wonder why I underlined that. So I zero in on that. Sometimes I'll write notes. Read for depth. And 15 minutes a day can make a huge difference in your life, especially if you're not doing it. I don't want to poke you on the chest, but the truth of the matter is, We're kind of Bible illiterate, and we just need to get in the Word and let the Holy Spirit teach us. And good Bible teaching, good Bible teaching church like this is so important. Nine byproducts of living in the Spirit. Think of the freedom that you have. You're not going to have this regret. You're not going to have this, I hope I don't get caught. Right? By living in the, the Spirit, the freedom that we experience. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there's no law. There's there's no restriction on that. You can love people to the depth. You can't even believe how much you can love. When we're in Panama, Panama was very difficult. A very difficult culture. Very difficult. And I I would say that my wife thrived and I barely survived. I'm not going to unpack that, but I'm telling you, it was just really, really hard. But one of the things... Um, that I think God put before us was this. The international community that comes to LifeBridge, to this church that we planted, they're there for a sh- very short period of time. When we launched the church, I think there was, what, 25, 28 different nations represented, multi-ethnic. Uh, yeah, the w- white people were in the minority. And that was a beautiful thing, just so you know. That was so cool. Um, 
But there's a song, and I thought it was by the Doobie Brothers, and my unbelieving friend said, no, no, it's not the Doobie Brothers, it's Crosby, Still, Nash & Young. And you're going to think, why are you bringing that song up? The song was Love the One You're With, which is a terrible song. <laughs> the young people go, what are you talking about? I'm going to have to Google that this afternoon. But the idea of that you're all in, that you love the people that are before you, because honestly, people transition, and we're seeing that in our own country. People are getting jobs and the migration of just work and city and all that stuff. And so to have this deep love, and it takes discipline, it's just not easy. So when Paul says the Spirit is love, Man, could you imagine if everyone in the world just embraced this? If all the believers in the world just embraced that, man, can I just love like Christ loves? What a beautiful world this would be. And so it's just this reminder. Then there's been seasons where joy went on a sabbatical in 2008. And uh, what God put on my heart was, Pastor, you've lost joy in ministry. Because, you know, you people, you've got a bunch of problems. Pastor Jeremy, Pastor, he, he didn't tell me any of your stories, but I know your stories. Because <laughs> I have those stories too. And we all have hurts. We all have, all have problems and issues. And God said, you know, Glenn, you, you've lost some joy. So everything that I was reading, the theme was joy. Took me to the book of Philippians. If you've kind of like the lights flickered in your joy meter, just, just read Philippians. Let's continue. Jesus says in John 15, 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the what? The vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do a lot of things, some things. No, see, I think we've got to be reminded of this. Without Christ, you can't accomplish anything. Graduates of high school, you're going on to college, man, you, you're going to have to fight some huge battles of temptation. And popularity and, and peer pressure to go along with the crowd. And all I have to say is four years is going to fly faster than your four years in high school. And some of those friends that are true friends that you meet in university, crew, or whatever, will be your lifelong friends. Those that you go drinking and carousing with, will not be your friends and are not your friends because they're living in the world. If you stay connected to Jesus, you're going to accomplish great things for His glory. Verse 23, against such things, there is no law. We must know Him and love Him and remember Him and submit to Him and imitate Him. That's what it's about. And our approval and our welcome is from the Father, does not rest on our character or our actions, but on His. Isn't that good news? Don't tell me you didn't sin this past week, because I know I did. You want to hear what I did? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> but Jesus knows, and He still forgives me. And as you walk closer and closer in the Spirit, not in the flesh, as you're abiding in Christ, the cool thing is you begin to sin less and less and less. We're not perfected until we're in glory. But you can have freedom. And you don't have to latch on to that sin that is plaguing you and tormenting you. Because honestly, Satan wants to kill you and he can't. But he wants to trip you up at every corner. And church, we need to be reminded that we belong to Christ. Look at Galatians 5.22. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. I was telling someone just the other day, sometimes you have to, when, when the devil gets in your head, come on, you know what I'm talking about? You know what I do? I verbally, out loud, get the hell out of my head. Are you offended by that? Because it is coming from hell. And he is defeated and he wants to trip me up. I, I'm telling you, in Panama... There wasn't a day. I wrote on my whiteboard, be alert. Because the minute I stepped out of my apartment, all sorts of things that we would face. Physical obstacles, visual distractions, on and on. 
And I had to be reminded, I have to abide in Christ. Crucifying the flesh, it's this sinful nature that really we identify and we're destroying these idols in our life. Look at your family history and then look at the things that kind of like trip you up, whatever they are. Could be gossip. Could be lying. Some good friend of mine says, my stepson is a habitual liar. He, doesn't, he cannot tell the truth. And actually the stepson's moving out to a different state and he's like, I am so happy. But the, think of that. Some of you are probably liars or cheats or whatever it may be. I'm not trying to, to guilt you this morning. But think of what is holding you back. Crucifying the flesh. Could be leisure. Uh, could be pleasure. Could be sports, relationships. It could be even family. Uh, we love our three kids. I, I love my two son-in-laws. Not everybody can say that, but I, I really love these guys. Uh, and now four grandbabies and the fifth on the way, guess what they call me? They call me rabbi. I know. <laughs> they call me rabbi because rabbi means teacher. There's nothing sacred about rabbi. And I just told my oldest daughter when she started having kids, I am not a grandpa. I'm not old enough. And this is Abuela, or Lala, Abuela's grandparent in Spanish. It's really cool. They have these little kids in Target going, Rabbi, Rabbi, and people are like, what? <laughs> but I want to teach that next generation, and I want to be that example for the next generation. And part of my responsibility is living in the, in the Spirit. Galatians 5.25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. We have this example in Christ, and he, <laughs> Christ wants us to live in freedom by living in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the source of our new life, and Paul is saying, just stay in step. Just keep following Jesus. Don't be distracted by the world. You know, it's, it's interesting. My son's going to be 25, and he's, now he's got a job, and he's paying off his student uh, loan. And I said, Grant, I said, just don't get sucked into like the Joneses. And he said, well, what's that? Like, you got to get this stuff. Getting stuff does not bring happiness and it does not satisfy. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. Is, is stuff wrong? No. Do I love big screen TVs during the Packer season? Yes. <laughs> but it's not an idol. And it's, hopefully it's not tripping me up. I, you know, and I've got checks and balances with my spouse. Hey, too much TV, too much football. But you get the idea. Follow Jesus. Don't follow the world. And I believe everybody needs a certain amount of approval from others. Do you agree with that? I mean, let's face it. You know, we want to be encouraged. We want to be liked. We want to be supported and all that. But some people go too far. And if people don't get that honor that they think they deserve or get that popularity, they become conceited and proud. Have you met those people? Have you worked with those people? Do you live with those people? The gospel creates this whole new self-image. That, that's the whole point of this. It's not based on our comparisons with others. Paul is saying that we can be both bold and humble. I can be bold for Christ because I know my identity is all wrapped up in what Christ has done for me. And the other thing, too, is I don't think I've always been too humble. And every year, about the first part of January, I'm like, Lord, I pray that this year I would be more humble than last year. Because I think of who Jesus is, and he was powerful, and he was authoritative. But the thing that the crowds were attracted to him was his humility, his strength, which was before them, and they understood, wow, this is a leader. And then what he spoke about that was radical, they hadn't heard these things before. But then his humility... Man, doesn't our world need some humility? I feel like saying, doesn't our president need some humility? But then I thought, I better not say that. All right. The Greek word translated conceit, verse 26 says, uh, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Conceit, in the Greek, it really means vainglorious or empty honor. Empty of honor. So conceit is this deep insecurity. It leads to this need to be approved and to prove ourselves to others. And when we're conceited, we're going to be provoking each other, and provoke is this idea of being competitive. 
meaning to challenge someone to a contest. Does that make sense? Conceited people, don't they provoke you? I mean, really, you want to punch them in the neck, but that's not, you know, that's not being like Christ. So how do you love them? And then envy means you want something that rightly, rightly belongs to someone else, or you want that person not to have it. That's also envy. And so in the church, when someone gets uh, promoted or even in our workplace, a lot of times there's backbiting. You know, guys that I worked with at the PD in Fond du Lac, someone would get promoted and they weren't happy about it. They gossiped and complained about the guy. Oh, yeah. And you know, I think we bring that into the church too. Shouldn't we be like cheering people on like these graduates? Actually, graduates, why don't you stand up real quick? Because we didn't do that because we were all graduated. We all stood up. They're like, should I stand up? He's not our pastor. He can't make me stand up. Okay, stand up. There we go. Wait a minute. Are you the only one in church that's graduating and we had a list of names? Okay, okay, all right. Because I, honestly, seriously, I, I wanted to shame them just a little bit and honor you because you're in church. Great. You know, the thing is, it's these rite of passages that we're all going to encounter, and we should be praying for these students. I heard this idea, and, I, and maybe this is going to help you, maybe it's new. What if, because I, I travel a lot now in our state, and I listen to a lot of messages, because I, I like that. What if you as a church adopted these students and you said, I am going to pray for you every week? Because they're your missionaries that you're sending out to universities that are really dark places. Let that marinate. If it's from the Spirit, some of you are going to jump on that. If it's not of the Spirit and it's just Glenn, it'll be dead by this afternoon. That's okay. We need to cover these young men and women. Okay, could really rally the church. All right, John Stott, let me round out here. John Stott believes that Paul is talking of two different ways of relating to one another. Provoking, he says, is the standpoint of someone who's unsure of his or her superiority, looking down on someone perceived to be weaker. See that a lot. We're a little bit more sophisticated, I think, in the church. We see a lot of that in elementary, middle school, and high school, right? Just look down on people. Envying is the position of someone who is conscious of inferiority looking up at someone they feel that is above them. So sometimes you see that too. You know, like, oh, I'm just, I'm nobody. You know, I'm not popular. I don't. It's all from the devil. It really is. Verse 26, it relates to work righteousness. And we need to live in line with the gospel and not retreat back to living by works. And again, if you come out of some more organized uh, religions, if you peel it back, it really works. And so you feel guilty if you're not doing something. God wants you to become more than just being. He wants you to become a Christ-like follower. Persons are trying to gain their worth. Oh, I said that already. Never mind. Review. Okay. Righteousness. Righteousness means more than goodness. Okay, your righteousness, it's more than just goodness. It's this complete right record and right relationship of God. If you've accepted Christ, you can stand before his throne knowing that you are completely forgiven and accepted. Key word, forgiven and accepted. If you haven't repented and come to faith in Christ, you're not going to feel righteous. And it's, righteousness is not on you. It's on what Christ did for you. Amen? So if you haven't made that decision to follow Christ and to train, you know, kind of take that step of repentance where you turn 180 degrees from the direction, then I would urge you to do it today. Talk to the elders, talk to Pastor Jeremy, talk to me. You don't want to leave here with the question mark of, hey, am, am, I, am I free? I'm telling you, I mess up a lot, but I know I am absolutely free. There's no burden that I'm carrying that's like, oh, I cast that away a long time ago. I put it at the foot of the cross. So, let me close this. Galatians 5, 13 to 14. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. You were called to that. 
That's Jesus' mandate for each one of us. You're called to that. Only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is filled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You love this church? Show up and clean this place. I get to a lot of churches. By the way, your church smells good. (laughs) But someone has to clean it. So just use it as a rallying point. Okay? I want to close with these two questions. I want you to reflect on this. Um, I know that the band's probably going to come up. Examine yourself. How can you see the fruit of the Spirit growing in your life? Would you meditate on that this afternoon? Would you think about that? Don't just take this message and then put it on a shelf. Interact with it this afternoon. The second question is, what are the idols which need identifying and dismantling in your life? That you need to just be done with it. And how can you replace that with Christ? Because why do you do drugs? Why do you look at pornography? Why do you have marital affairs? Because you're messed up with your identity in Christ. You really believe that He's not sufficient. And He is more than sufficient, my friend. So walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. Let me close in prayer. Father God, Thank you for these good people at Lakeside. Thank you for Pastor Jeremy and his family. Father, I pray a blessing upon him. Thank you that Lakeside is a part of a bigger movement called Converge, Converge Great Lakes, and that they have a part to play in the world, not just in this county, not just in the state. And so I pray that you'd lead them by your spirit. Pray a blessing upon each person here and the, and the graduates, Lord. I pray that if it is of the Spirit, that families would adopt these students and just pray for them, and they will never even know the power until maybe they get to heaven. So Lord, I pray for just a continued um, faithfulness by this church and uh, help us all to be reminded that we can, live in, we can live in freedom with Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said,